Hello there, everyone, and welcome to the recording of the material from chapter two that we covered in our in class lecture. And then I'm now recording um, for either you to review if you were in class or for you to see for the first time if you didn't happen to attend class during week two. Um, as the title indicates, this material is eligible for inclusion in your examination. So if you have any questions about the material being covered here, um, you can always send me an email and ask me to provide some additional clarification. <clears throat> if you weren't in class, I also recommend you potentially reaching out to your peers to just get a little bit more of an understanding about how we talked about this material in class just to more help you fully understand the material rather than the idea that you know if you didn't hear this in class you're disadvantaged because that is not the intention so where did this material fit in during class well we had just finished talking about the rhetoric of claims we had talked about what grounds are we had talked about what warrants are and we had talked about what conclusions were now the way i introduced this additional material is highlighting that if you are identifying a social problem you've gone through you've establish the grounds for claiming that something is a social problem. You have your warrant, which establishes why something needs to be done about the problem. And then finally, you would have your conclusion, which outlines how you would address the problem. I am now introducing uh, formally the concept of social structure at this point to highlight the following. If you have identified a social problem, that social problem likely exists due to existing systems of inequality, existing social structures, enduring patterns that while they are made up of the actions of individuals are not entirely dependent upon a single individual. You are born into a society in which these structures already exist, and therefore they are having a continuous impact on you and your life and the way you think about things and the way you act, whether you realize it or not. That's why the study of sociology and the study of social problems in particular is what I call the study of sneaky bullshit. And that's because you have things like social structures which impact social life and the life of the individual, but they're not obvious. So that's why we're taking some time now to outline briefly what social structures are. Now, I've mentioned before in a past uh, in-person lecture, the idea that social structures are things that are very hard to perfectly define within sociology because they're such a key foundational concept that within each sub-discipline of sociology and of social science, there are slight permutations of the definition to best fit the needs of that specific sub-discipline. So, while I've tried to go ahead and provide an outline of what social structures are in a more general fashion, I also want to acknowledge that this framing of social structures comes from a structural symbolic interactionist frame. So just like with any presentation of material, any formulation of ideas, there is some degree of intellectual bias. And by that, I mean, if you work within a paradigm or a framework, you are often operating under the principles of that framework, which then tends to emphasize certain elements of society and not directly examine others as closely. So with that all out of the way, let's talk about social structure and some things that I wanted to use to indicate what a social structure is. So what is a social structure? One thing that identifies whether something is a social structure, I'm actually, first I'm gonna skip to point two, which is what I did in class. What are social structures in the most abstract? Social structures are things that result in detectable social patterns. To a degree, you could argue that these social patterns are in effect um, a social structure, or at least a component of social structure. So what do I mean by social patterns? Whenever you take even a casual look out your window, you don't even have to do this with research, you can tell that there are systematic patterns of behavior, of interaction, and of distribution of resources. How can we tell this just by looking out the window? If you look out the window right now, or you're walking down the Esplanade at campus, or let's say you're sitting in the student center and you're eating lunch, right? It is not impossible, but it is highly, highly, highly improbable to the point of being, you know, a little bit absurd. The idea that as everyone is in there, you know, talking, eating lunch in the student center hub, we have someone who comes through uh, wearing nothing but their undergarments doing cartwheels down the center aisle of the student center. 
do people have the agency to do this? Absolutely, they do. The, any individual in that student center could be the person who, you know, strips down to their undergarments and then decides to try and cartwheel through the place. <clears throat> it's possible, right? It's within the realm of possible things, but it is not within the realm of probable things, right? Y if you go to the student center every day for the next five years, you will not see, unless you decide to do it yourself despite me, <laughs> You will not find someone in their undergarments doing cartwheels down the main uh, thoroughfare of the student center. So this indicates that there is a detectable pattern in social life. That pattern being people are eating in the student center. They are talking in the student center. And they're also not doing cartwheels in their undergarments. These patterns, because they are patterns, they don't just arise because they exist. Sociology considers that view of society anathema to good science. We don't just say that things exist because they exist. We accept that if there are patterns, there are underlying reasons for those patterns. Those patterns and the things that cause those patterns are the best way to think of social structure at an introductory level, okay? It's these forces that result in detectable social patterns, but it's also a product. Social structures are things that we create and recreate through our interaction. And I'll give you an example of that a little bit later. But it's important to understand that this concept of social structure does not deny agency. Okay? It does not deny that humans have agency. It is a recognition that there are factors at play that shape the degree to which humans are likely to use their agency in a given way. So that goes now to point one on the slide. Now that we know that, you know, one of the best ways to think of or at least detect social structures are to look for patterns in society, we can go to point one, which highlights that social structures are forces and products, they are patterns, they are elements of society that facilitate or constrain the probability of a certain line of behavior or a certain line of thought occurring. So it's not that social structures only facilitate, you know, only constrain behavior, the idea that there are social structures in play in the student center and society at large that stop, that constrain you in terms of thinking, oh, I can, you know, script, bleh, get down into my undergarments and do cartwheels. There's also social structures that facilitate certain types of behavior. So why is it that whenever you go into the student center, if you were to do, you know, just a quick tally of what everyone's doing, why are you finding that most people are eating there? Most people are talking there. Most people are sitting while they are eating, right? These are behaviors that are being engaged in, but we can see that it doesn't seem to be just randomly engaging in it, that there seems to be some sort of pattern in engagement of these behaviors. That too is a result of social structure. Social structure does not just constrain behavior. It facilitates other forms of behavior dependent upon the social structure. I'll give you an example regarding um, class and gender and some other things whenever we get to the final component of this short recording. But I just want to highlight that off the bat because it can be it can be quite quite annoying the thought that there's social structure and all it does is constrain our possibility of choice. It doesn't. It also facilitates certain lines of choice. And that's an important thing to consider. If you're only considering how social structure restrains behavior, you're not seeing how social patterns also make other types of behavior more likely. For example, if I have a social structure that in effect rewards bad behavior by giving you an A, even if you cheat on an examination, the social structure, those patterns that have various forces shaping them, such as the manner in which I, the instructor, conduct the lesson, the rules in place at the university for cheating and so on. If these things facilitate you cheating, right, that is a social structure that facilitates a type of behavior. Final thing that I want to reemphasize from this is point three on the slide, which is that social structure is both a social process slash force as well as a social product. That is to say, these elements of society that result in detectable social patterns are both 
forces in that they impact something, they shape social life, but they're also products. They are the product of the actions of individuals. So these so say the social structure that constrains your desire to cheat. So the idea that uh, the university has policies in place like zero tolerance for plagiarism. You plagiarize and they're going to suspend you from the university. Like there, there's clearly rules in place that indicate we are not joking around if you get caught cheating. Those rules came about because individuals in interactions, in groups, chose to implement that system. Now, social structures differ into the degree to which you're you know, aware of the fact that you're shaping a social structure, whether you're doing it consciously or unconsciously. But the point is that this structure doesn't just exist because it happens in nature, because it's an immutable law of humanity. It is something that is created and recreated by humans. Now, just because something is created by humans doesn't mean that we can all just, you know, shut our eyes and the power of it disappears, right? Um, just because something is a social construct doesn't mean it's not real in the social sense. If it has an effect on individuals and individuals act towards something as though it's real, it is real in its effect is the idea. I'm treating it as a social individual as real and I'm acting accordingly. And that in the social sphere makes it real. So later when we're talking about large social structures like gender or race, right? Whenever there's the discussion about how these are social constructs, that doesn't mean that they're meaningless. They're infused with meaning and they have a large degree of impact on how social interaction is conducted, right? It just means that they are not something that exists independent of human cognition. And that is something if you're uh, wanting to like argue about how gender or race actually are something separate from human cognition, that's completely fine. That is something that we'll be discussing at a later point in one of these additional um, uh, recordings. So that's our first slide. What are social structures? They are elements of a society that result in detectable patterns. So they are stable components of a society that over time shape behaviors. They do this by facilitating or constraining the possibility or the likelihood of various behaviors being enacted. And these social structures, while they operate as a force in that they shape social life, they in turn are shaped and reshaped through the enactment of that social life through individuals exercising their agency within these forces that facilitate or constrain certain lines of behavior. Then social structure in general. Now I want to talk about a specific type of social structure. So in week one, we talked a bit about inequality, this idea that there are differences in terms of the level of resources that people have, right? And we also found through our in-class activity the idea that unless constant and active force is being applied to rectify an inequality, inequalities perpetuate themselves over time. They have a type of social inertia to where once there's an unequal distribution of wealth or resources, the group that has more resources will then be able to employ those resources to ensure that they continue to have the largest pool of various types of resources. That's fundamentally what inequality is. Now we want to talk about stratification systems which are social structures that lead to inequality. And we're talking about social stru uh, uh, stratification systems as social structures. We're talking about what, at least within my field of sociology, we would call large social structures. So what do I mean by stratification systems? These are social structures that are embodied in institutional processes that do various things. One, these institutional processes define certain types of goods or assets as valuable and desirable. So this could be, you know, social norms defining money as valuable. But then we also have institutional processes that define certain educational credentials as desirable, um, certain ways of speaking as desirable, certain types of knowledge that are desirable. So that's one way um, uh, stratification systems impact inequality in that there are social structures involved in the actual identification and delineation of things as valuable. But perhaps more importantly, whenever it comes to systems of stratification, there are patterns in society that are largely the result of rules 
right? Formally codified and often, in many ways, informally um, codified rules that allocate the distribution of goods and resources across jobs or divisions in the division of labor. So the idea is that not only are certain things defined as valuable, but there are social structures in place that result in the establishment of rules that shape how resources are distributed. Now, when you think about it, though, from our first week lesson, these rules do not come about in a vacuum. You have to have human interaction for social or uh, for social products such as social structures to both emerge and continue to be reified over time. So in that light, it's not surprising that those who already have resources are the ones who are able to best influence the formulation of the rules for allocating resources. And unsurprisingly, those who have resources are not going to disadvantage themselves when it comes to the creating of rules that delineate how resources will be distributed. It, like this could be something as simple as capitalism, right? It's the idea that you do work, you get paid an hourly wage. Without much critical examination, that could seem fair. And in many ways it can be fair, but we also have to see that that system of rules also benefits those who already have resources because it establishes things like it is not legitimate to acquire resources through force. You have to go ahead and acquire it through legal channels of work, which prevents, say, poor masses from seizing the means of production, as Marx would put it. There are rules now in place that identify that forcefully taking the tools of a factory so that the workers can produce their own goods and sell them on the market is not legitimate. Those workers have to either buy their own tools or they have to work for someone who already has them. This altogether, this idea that there are already existing inequalities in these resources that have been defined as valuable and that these inequalities are going to impact the formation of rules that delineate how resources will be allocated. It results in what's known as a mobility mechanism, where your place in a social structure, your social position, is largely shaped by those systems of stratification. So what do I mean by this? If you are someone who is born in a group that has lower access to resources, whether that group be, for whatever reason, uh, has lower access to resources because of job type, whether it be because of race and racial history, uh, whether, it, you know, because we have a history in the United States of racial inequality. And as we know, unless you're constantly putting effort to undermine that equality, um, even if you eliminate the original source of that inequality, that inequality will continue to perpetuate. Uh, we have this also in gender. We, uh, for the longest time, had a formal system of inequality that removed or uh, restricted women's ability to do things like acquire educational credentials, credentials or political resources by running for office. And even though that formally was rectified by removing those barriers through a constitutional amendment, because those inequalities still existed and there wasn't a constant continual input of resources to undermine that equality, that stratification in terms of gender inequality remains. So what happens whenever you are born into a stratification system and you're born into the group that has structurally less resources than another group? You are less likely to be able to climb the social hierarchy and gain additional resources because of the position you were born into. The resources of the group that you were born into contributes to the formative experiences that you have over time, the assets and resources that you're able to make, that you have available to you as you grow up. And this in turn shapes your, uh, the probability of your outcomes in terms of acquiring these valuable resources. So this is a mobility mechanism. It links individuals to social positions, this is often in the form of jobs, and this generates unequal control over valued resources. So if you are born in a poor or working class rural household, you're going to be exposed to um, meanings that are that are taught in these kind of households, such as various types of work ethic, ideas about keeping your head down and just doing your work, right? 
these sort of learned meanings will impact the type of job you're likely to acquire and that type of job you acquire is going to determine the resources you have and you're less likely to get a high paying job using the skills you learned in that low status low power group of poor working class than you are if you were the son of a wall street investment banker who growing up you would have picked up little tips and tricks on how to make yourself successful in the business world which will likely result in you getting a very high paying job and making more money than the son of a poor working class family member this doesn't mean that it is impossible for you to change your social position from the you know the uh, group that you were born into Right? It doesn't deny that. We are accepting that humans have agency. What this is doing is acknowledging that this pattern exists, that if you are born into a low class group, you have a lower likelihood of being in a high value job relative to someone who was born into a high class group. Doesn't mean that's impossible for you, the individual to, but it means whenever we look at a society, this pattern is there and we can empirically determine that it is there. This is not me using rhetoric to say this is what I believe. This is empirically documented that there are these patterned inequalities. Stratification systems lead to these patterned inequalities because they result in groups having different access, not only to resources, but the ability to acquire new resources and shape the rules by which resources are acquired. And this is what helps perpetuate this continued unequal distribution of resources. So I was saying gender is one of these sorts of things. If you're born um, and, identif and society identifies you as a woman, you are less likely to be taken seriously by your math and science teachers, especially in high school, which means you're going to receive less rigorous math and science training, which means you're less likely to get a STEM position as a woman, which means you are more likely to be shunted into a traditional female type of job, which empirically, this pattern is proven, you will be paid less. Those jobs are paid less because the rules for allocating resources has determined that these primarily female dominated jobs, such as secretaries, nurses, and high school teachers are not as valuable as say things like computer scientists. So this gets into this idea next slide that there are different type, different levels of social structure okay and this is also important because it's not just that there's this amorphous classification system there are various levels to which these patterns shape our lives <clears throat> so again i'm drawing from a number of fields of sociology to try and give you a very base overview of what social structure is so in some ways i'm simplifying some things and i'm omitting some other very nuanced um, components of this discussion. So if you're interested in this, please reach out to me and I'd be happy to talk about this concept more. The final uh, slide that actually has detailed information on it that might be relevant to your exam is this idea that within social psychology, we have what are known as macro and micro structures. And this is how, you know, within social psychology and specifically within my field of structural symbolic interactionism, this is how we sort of think about these levels of social structure. So macro structures are social structures, they're forces that result in pattern behaviors that impact the proximate context individuals find themselves in. And this is often stratification systems, right? Because your location within a stratification system, the economic class you're born into, the gender that society assigns to you, the race that has been, you know, is socially assigned to you, these shape what kind of context you find yourself in. So let's go with race as an example. We know that due to, uh, you know, continue reifying economic inequalities, that if you are black, you are likely to find yourself going to a high school school district that is predominantly black. So the social structure, the stratification system that you found yourself in and your position within the racial stratification system, because we do find that there are structural inequalities in terms of resources by race, this shapes who you come into contact with on a daily basis. It shapes the proportion of the student body who is also black. It shapes the type of teachers you have, it shapes the expectations of those teachers, it shapes your school and you know your collective group 
as a school's competition with other schools for resources at the state level. So the macro structure of race, the stratification system, impacts the local context you find yourself in. This is what we think of in structural symbolic interactionism as a macro structure or a large social structure. Now, moving down from these society spanning systems of stratification, we have what are called proximate contexts, right? And I was trying to outline that earlier that these proximate contexts, these proximate structures, sometimes called mesostructures, are the conditions in which actual behavior occurs. So the gender composition of your classroom, the racial composition of your classroom is a proximate context, is a mesostructure. And we find that these proximate structures, the, you know, the composition of your proximate conditions impact how you think and how you behave. For example, if you're in a classroom in which you are uh, a white student and the majority of the students in the room are black students, even with that, because of larger societal uh, systems of expectations, you will find yourself being taken more seriously in certain academic pursuits. People will be more likely to defer to you because of the composition of the group. Another example, if you are a female and you find yourself in a group uh, with other ma with males and you're focused on a STEM related task, you are likely to be taken less seriously by your peers in that task group compared to your male colleagues. But the fact that you were in a group that was focused on STEM activities and that you were with male colleagues these proximate conditions are shaped by larger systems of stratification. So these are mesostructures. Now, it'd be really easy to leave it there. And to a degree, some studies in sociology do leave it there, this connection between macro and proximate structures, right? But there's one more level that I really want you to consider, and it's this idea of micro social structures. And in this context, especially for this class, we're defining micro -soci social structures as those mental schema, those mental frameworks and psychological processes that shape how you think about yourself, how you think about others, and how you therefore subsequently behave. Because we act upon the way we think about a situation, how we perceive ourselves, how we perceive our environment. Micro structures are what shape these processes. So, for example, Whenever I am, whenever we're in a classroom, right, anyone could get up and start screaming or could get up and just, you know, start talking to someone next to them. But largely this doesn't happen. Why? Because the students have internalized that they're being recognized, like everyone sees them as a student in this classroom, which means they see themselves as a student. And they see me as a teacher and they recognize others see me as a teacher. And in so doing, recognizing that they occupy this position of student and I occupy a position of teacher, they understand that there are certain meanings and therefore expectations for behavior in this situation. And they conform to these expectations for a variety of reasons, to, to uh, be verified, to avoid punishment. But the idea is that it's not just who's around them. It's the fact that they're operating on internalized structured understandings of a situation and that shaping of the thought process that has been internalized by the individual that results in given lines of behavior so in the example of the classroom your internalized understanding of what it means to be a student especially relative to a teacher constrains certain lines of action you're not going to get up and start uh, screaming and it facilitates other lines of interaction, such as if I was talking to you, you'd probably look at me and start nodding your head to indicate that you understood. This internalized set of expectations are microstructures. So here's a visualization of kind of how you can think of these things being related. You have macrostructures, these society spanning systems of stratification. <clears throat> these result in your placement within proximate contexts which bring up microstructures and also teach you microstructures. So if I was born in a low class, if I was born in a poor household, that's gonna shape my proximate context in terms of my house household life, which will also involve me learning um, certain expectations for behavior. I uh, am socialized with these microstructures. 
And because of this, in any given situation, there are certain lines of behavior that are more or less likely. For example, we find in studies of uh, child raising that in working in poor class households, uh, children become less likely to ask questions whenever given a directive by a parent because it's they've been socialized to understand that you respond to an order, you don't question an order. In um, middle class, upper middle class, and upper class households, we find that children will actually ask questions of directives in part because parents respond to these questions by helping the child work through the thought process. They have now internalized a microstructure of thinking about a situation partially because of the proximate context the individual is in and over time this leads to a set of probabilities regarding various outcome behaviors such as asking questions when receiving a directive. If we're looking at gender, we have things like, OK, so you've been so you have been placed in the stratification system of gender. Whenever you go into the proximate context of work, there are certain expectations of competency that um, have been internalized by you and other individuals in the situation. And this likely results in you, if you're a female, being taken less seriously at work and therefore you're less likely to volunteer information at work. How does this get into the idea that structures are a product as well as a process? The idea is if you are not as forthcoming with information at work because you have been socialized and your proximate contacts have taught you that, you know, you really won't be taken seriously, it's safer to just say nothing, you're not going to be elevated in status as quickly. You're not going to get promoted as quickly, which then reifies this existing structural stratification of resources in terms of um, the rewards you get for various job positions. So this is what in this course, uh, this is how we'll be thinking of social structure. So thank you all for following along. If you have any questions about this video, please just reach out to me and I'd be happy to talk to you about it. As uh, indicated in the title and the folder this is placed in, this material will be eligible uh, for being covered in your examination. And I guarantee you at least something from this video will be on at least your first examination. So please take some time to really consider the points we've talked about today. And thank you for your attention.